what we're looking at in this video is a very straightforward circuit with a resistor and a capacitor. And when I draw it, it looks like this. We should recognize this. It looks like a potential divider. At the top of the circuit, we have a resistor. But instead of having another resistor lower down in the potential divider, we have a capacitor. Other than that, it's two um, passive components in series. And we should know that for a potential divider, we're able to measure the output voltage, V out, and we're able to measure the input voltage, V in. And the output voltage depends upon both the input voltage and the values of the two components. So we're going to see if the same applies to this circuit, even though one of the components is a capacitor. But we're going to be doing something slightly different. Instead of using a DC supply and a voltmeter, we're going to be using a signal generator, which is attached to my green wire. And we're going to be using an oscilloscope to measure the input voltage. And we're going to be using a second oscilloscope to measure the output voltage. So that's my circuit. We're going to see what it does, and we're going to see if we can understand the mathematics behind it. So here's our circuit drawn out on the board. We have a resistor and a capacitor in series making what is effectively a potential divider. But instead of a battery, we have a signal generator providing an AC voltage, and we have in a pair of oscilloscopes, which are acting as AC voltmeters. I'm going to be measuring the peak voltages. And we should know that for a potential divider, the output voltage depends upon the input voltage and the values of the two components. So our graph that we've drawn, we want to work out how the gain varies as a function of frequency. So we need to think about some of these things. So first of all, the gain, as we know, is V out divided by V in. So that's our first um, piece of information which we're going to use. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to make use of the potential divider equation, which is V out divided by V in equals R2 over R1 plus R2. But now we need to make some modifications because we should know that the capacitor doesn't have resistance. The capacitor has something called reactance and the reactance is 1 over 2 pi Fc. So although the capacitor is a, a reactive element, we can think of it as having a type of resistance, but we must call it reactance and we must be aware that it's not actually a resistance. So to modify my potential divider equation, instead of writing R2, I'm going to write Xc. And instead of writing R1, I'm simply just going to write R. But there's another very important change. As I said, a capacitor does not have a resistance, it has a reactance. And in a reactor, the phase between the voltage and current is different. And therefore, the voltages in the resistor and the capacitor don't peak at the same time. So this means that our equation is not numerically correct. It still gives us the right order of magnitude, so I'm going to put an approximately sign there. And in another video, I'll explain numerically what actually happens. So this is the equation we're going to work with. So there are two situations we're going to consider. The first situation is when we have a low frequency. Okay, for a low frequency, when the value of F is small, then the reactance of the capacitor is very high. So for a low frequency, Xc will be much greater than R. So our equation becomes, our potential divider equation becomes, the gain is equal to, oh sorry, approximately equal to Xc divided by Xc. Because the R, which is very, very small, has very little effect. So this is approximately 1. So at low frequencies, our gain is approximately 1, and it doesn't really depend on the frequency. Now the next question is, what about at high frequencies? Now at high frequencies, what we have here is a reactance of a capacitor is now very small. The resistor is much greater than the reactance. The reactance of the capacitor has become very small at high frequencies. So the gain is approximately 1.5. 
So we have to keep the xe on the top, but on the bottom of the equation we only need to write the r. So the gain is approximately some function of the reactance. So that means as the frequency goes up, the gain is going to get smaller. So something like that. So we have a, an idea that at low frequencies, the gain is approximately constant, approximately 1, and at high frequencies, the gain is reducing. So we probably ought to go and see whether this is what actually happens. So what we've got here is the input and output being shown on the oscilloscope and I'm measuring the frequency which I've started off at 10 Hertz, a nice low frequency. The red channel is measuring the peak to peak voltage of the input, so this is the in and it's around about 10 volts which makes sense because on the scale over here it goes up to about plus 5 and down to about minus 5. So that seems to be reasonable. And the blue line, which is measuring the peak-to-peak -peak voltage of the output, so this is V out, okay, and it is also 10 volts at the moment, and that's reasonable because it's about 5 volts here and about minus 5 volts there. So those are our two traces on the oscilloscope, and I'm going to vary the frequency and see how the traces change to see whether or not it meets our expectations. So I've taken away the annotation so that I can use the oscilloscope. So what we've got here is that the input and output are both about 10 volts, so the gain is 1. As we would expect at a low frequency, the gain is 1. We're now going to increase the frequency, so we increase it to 100 Hz. And what we can see straight away is that at 100 Hz, the input and output voltages are both around about 10, so the gain is still 1. What you need to do is you need to read the... Um, frequency and the voltages from the values at the bottom down here where I've got the mouse at the moment. Okay, and I'll keep changing the time base so that the traces look similar. So at 100 Hz, the gain is still 1. The gain doesn't depend on the frequency. At 1000 Hz, there we are at 1000 Hz, the gain is still around about 1. The input voltage and the output voltage are both about 10 volts, give or take a bit of error and therefore the gain hasn't much changed, it hasn't depended upon frequency. Now we're going to go to 10,000 Hz. What we can... What we can see at 10 kHz is that the input voltage has stayed at around about 10 volts, but now the output voltage is down to about 7.1 volts. So suddenly the output voltage is falling, the gain is now less than 1, as the frequency has started to get higher, which is what we'd expect. Let's go to an even higher frequency, we're going to go to 100 kilohertz. At 100 kilohertz, we're almost there, 90, 99 kilohertz, what you find now is the input voltage has stayed at around about 10 volts. I'll just increase it slightly. But the output voltage is now down at about 1.1 1 volts or so, so the output is now very much smaller than the input, the gain is very much less than 1. And now we're going to see if we can get all the way up to 1 megahertz. And at 1 megahertz what you can see, and at 1 megahertz what you can see is the input is now still around about 10 volts, but the output is now only about 100 millivolts, very very small indeed, so the gain is now significantly less than it was before. So that's a demonstration of what we would expect to happen based upon our theory we developed earlier. So what I've got here is the data that I've taken from my experiment. I've recorded frequency and I've recorded the input voltage which has stayed at around about 10 volts and I've recorded the output voltage which has got less as the frequency has got higher and I took all these readings live off the circuit I had and off the oscilloscope I had so I'm going to analyze them now. So the first thing we're going to work out is the gain and you notice it has no units, it's a ratio so it's just equal to the out divided by the in and my initial gain is very close to 1, which is what we'd expect, but as we go down, what we find is that the gain gets significantly less.
and we've plotted this on a graph here. Here is the gain going from 0 up to 1 and the frequency along the axes going all the way up to 1 megahertz. Now this graph looks very unhelpful, it's not very easy to read, but we can do a few tricks and the first trick is that we should make the scale, so I'm going to format the axes, logarithmic. And if I make the scale logarithmic, then the graph now looks much more reasonable. What we've got here is at low frequencies, so this is 1 hertz, 10 hertz, the first reading we took, at low frequencies the gain stays constant, and then at around about just after a thousand hertz marks it starts falling down, and then at very high frequencies it sort of tails off, doesn't really get much lower, down to zero. Okay, so that's sort of what we expect from our results. We can make the graph look even better if we format this axis and make it logarithmic as well. Has the unfortunate effect of putting the um, frequency axis values at the top, but never mind. But what we see now is that you've got the gain staying at 1 all the way along, and then all of a sudden turns a corner. It's quite a sharp turn now on this graph, and it's a very linear fit all the way down as we carry on going down. So we've got a straight line part of the graph here and a straight line part of the graph here, and that's just fantastic. So back looking at the results again. So we have our circuit drawn on the board. We have a resistance of value R and a capacitor with a reactance XC. And here's the graph shown here that we took off the um, oscilloscope and then we analyzed on the spreadsheet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at various different parts of the graph. So this part of the graph here, this first section of the graph, this is where the gain remains constant. And here the gain is approximately one and the reason for that is because the value of the reactance there is very much greater than the resistance. So that's the features of this part of the graph here. Okay, if I take a different part of the graph and I take this part over here, okay, what we find there is that the gain is reducing and we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. And that's because here R is very much greater than the reactance. So in the blue section of the graph where the gain is constant, the reactance is very high, the frequency is low. Remember that we had the equation that reactance is 1 over 2 pi Fc. So as F increases, reactance decreases. So in this green part of the graph with the nice fit, we've got um, the reactance is very small. Now, the next thing to look at is analyzing the graph itself. So what we'll do is we'll take the straight line drawing tool. There it is. And we can see that a straight line fits on there pretty well like that. Okay, and then we can see that this line here is also pretty linear. Okay, and they cross over at a point. And this point here is a corner. And the frequency at which that occurs is called the corner frequency. Now, what should that corner frequency be? Well, in the blue side of the graph, we have that the reactance is much greater than the resistance, and in the green side of the graph we have that the resistance is much greater than the reactance. So it seems only reasonable that where the corner frequency occurs is when the reactance is actually equal to the resistance. It's where neither of the capacitor or the, capacit or the resistor have priority, it's where they have equal each other. So let's see what that means in terms of the maths of it. So we already have our reactance here, so let's write R equals 1 over 2 pi Fc, and that's making the resistance equal to the reactance, and because it only occurs at one very special frequency, we call that frequency F0, the corner frequency. And if we rearrange this equation, we get the corner frequency is 1 over 2 pi Rc.
and that's a lovely way of being able to work out the performance of our filter but what we should do is we should actually check that this is correct so in my practical I had C was actually equal to 10 nanofarads and R was actually equal to 1500 ohms so let's work out what the corner frequency should have been so if we take our calculator it's not a very competent calculator I'm using it in standard mode so what we'll do is we'll do 2 times pi which is 3.14 times by R which is 1500 times by C which is 10 divided by I'm doing this the long way a thousand that's milli million micro thousand million nano equals now that doesn't look very right but we have to do one over it and we get 10,600 Hertz around about the 10 kilohertz mark and if we look at our graph then you see that in actual fact it's a bit hard to see here but the chord of frequency is at around about the 10 kilohertz mark why might it might it not be exactly correct well the capacitor has a tolerance of plus or minus 20 percent so it could be a little bit out so just to finish off i always think it's useful to have a way to intuitively understand these things so here's our circuit and we're back with our actual physical circuit here now rather than drawing it like that i like to draw it like this convince yourself that they're the same all i've done is turn this top resistor and made it horizontal move that one out of the way and i'll show you why this is a nice way to draw it it allows you to think about these passive filters and understand them very quickly so let's consider a low frequency if you consider a low frequency so a low frequency i'm going to represent with my brown pen if i think about it the reactance of the capacitor is extremely high so it's almost like it's not there it's like it's just a gap it's like it's the air gap. It's like there's there's no connection between there and there. This is millions of ohms, so it's like this it may as well not be there. So what happens is the low frequencies go straight from the input to the output. They pass straight through. So that's why it's a low pass filter. The low frequencies pass through. However, if I were to think of this as a uh, high frequency, so my high frequencies are going to be in orange. If I think about what happens to the high frequencies, then the reactance of the capacitor is actually very, very low. It's almost like it's just a piece of wire. So if you imagine replacing this capacitor with just a piece of wire like this, made a real mess of my diagram now, then what's going to happen is the high frequencies are going to come along and they're going to be effectively shorted down to ground by that piece of wire. It's not a piece of wire, but it's a capacitor with a very low reactance, a very low value. So that's why the low frequencies are able to pass through the filter, but the high frequencies are not. And I think drawing it this way and picturing it like this allows you to have a more intuitive understanding of how the filter's working without resorting necessarily to the math.